So we have about <clears throat> 45 minutes or so, I think, for discussion. And while you're getting poised with your name cards, um, I just want to ask one question of um, the panel to start, and that is um, through these various implementation um, projects that we've heard about, how um, successfully have you been able to engage diverse populations? Are we, are we effectively catering to fairly well-to-do, fairly homogeneous groups and um, enhancing health disparities, or are we able to reach out to diverse groups? But um, Geisinger diversity consists of Italians or Germans, um, so um, that's one, one type of diversity, I guess. Um, we actually have looked at our uh, MyCode uh, population and compared it demographically to our general patient population. They're mostly similar. Uh, the MyCode population is slightly older and is slightly more female. And, and that would uh, make some sense because as we look at the biggest um, uh, factor for recruitment into my code, it's how many times you come to the clinic. Uh, basically the opportunity to bump into a consenter. So, but other than that, um, there are no issues uh, related to uh, um, other demographic dis uh, differences in terms of socioeconomic status. Uh, uh, we're uh, mostly, I guess we're officially designated as a densely rural uh, population in a brilliant government oxymoron. Um, so we are, we do have the ability to even reach out to very small communities and um, we've actually recruited um, members from uh, just about every county in the entire state of Pennsylvania and now of course we're in New Jersey. The New Jersey population is a different population. There's, uh, it's much more transient, there's much more uh, race and ethnicity diversity and the health uh, system is is much less, uh, yes, yeah, there's a few of those too. Um, and, and the uh, um, Geisinger's been in central Pennsylvania for 100 years, whereas the Atlantic Air system, which is now part of Geisinger, has been there much lower. So we were concerned that we would not see the same uptake, um, but we have seen essentially identical consent rates uh, to the project uh, at Atlantic Air. In fact, the biggest uh, issue for them now is when are you going to do the next batch of sequencing because we get a bunch of our samples in that next run and our folks really want to start to get results back. So at least in our system, it's been working well. Peter, do you want to? Yes. So um, although we're on the north side of Chicago, um, we range you know, in our catchment up to the Wisconsin border. So Lake County is very different from Cook County in terms of Chicago demographics. And even just talking to our primary care physicians at the different sites, there are different issues to this. And so what we're looking at is you know, as part of um, separate projects, but again, this is where cutting through different lines in our in our healthcare system, looking at some of our public health initiatives, how are these intersecting with the application of genomics over to address these issues at truly a, a population health level as, as well. But there are there are a different set of barriers there. Lincoln, maybe you can comment about your um, population? Or not? Oh, does he? I'm realizing how disadvantaged this side of the room is because you can't really see. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple words. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually trying to log into the system to get the data um, to answer the question, but um, in, in real time. But um, we, we, we basically are addressing that in two ways. One is just by virtue of the reach we have, um, we're, we're obviously getting the patients that are out there in a, in, in a diversity of patients. and maybe in 10 minutes I can tell you what that means. Um, but the other way is we actually have established a series of research collaborations where people have both retrospective and prospective um, uh, populations uh, that, uh, th that, 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 that we've targeted to try to build up those data sets for uh, various um, ethnic backgrounds. And so um, uh, that, th those are the two ways we're, we're approaching it. Great, thank you. I think, Mark, you may have had your thing up first. Yeah, but uh, it was a question for Lincoln, so put me on hold. <laughs> okay. And, um, Laurie, did you have a question or? Uh, I have a question. Oh. Um, it's really to the whole panel, but specifically um, to Peter. Use your mic, please. Um, this 
question can be answered by anyone on the panel, but specifically for Peter, Lincoln, and Mark. You know, we're talking tomorrow about when do we have enough evidence, what evidence is required for implementation, and when do we have enough? So given that you gave some really clear examples of either implementation process outcomes, like speed of return of results or returned results, what would you say to a new health plan coming to you and saying, um, should we implement genomic medicine? And if so, in which populations? Can you extrapolate from success in oncology to inherited disease risk or, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease? So I'd just be, because as I was listening to you, I heard that there were some key constructs for success, like a lot of you talked about um, your experience, and I was not noting some themes, but I'd be interested in hearing your perspective. So, uh, so just to clarify, when you say you know a, a health plan, there are a lot of differences. You mean you know, a health plan that's sponsored by the organization that's actually running this versus you know in our health system we have a wide variety of, of payers. Um, what kind of market you're in? So in Chicago, we're still a fee-for-service dominated market because Blue Shield and Blue Cross have, I think, don't quote me on this, but maybe a 70 percent share of the market. So. These are somewhat questions that have to be addressed at an individual institution level. Then also, part of it is, well, what outcome are you looking for? Are you looking for a, a dollar saved or a patient care outcome? Ideally, a combination, you'd want to show both. So that was a long-winded way of saying that, you know, and, and partly, too, is, well, you know, kind of um, positioning in, in, in the marketplace of your health system as, as well. So there are a lot of different um, factors that play a role in it. And I think, um, you know, identifying success is going to be different from each institution depending on the sort of the microenvironment of, of their, their culture. Um, so for us, you know, we've been, you know, been focusing on, well, we know that there are patients in our system that um, we haven't identified that could benefit using you know, things that are pretty well accepted in CCN guideline evidence-based. So as a starting point, let's try to capture this patient because we know from a medical perspective these patients should be identified and start to measure the impact of it, which hopefully will guide us further on some of these questions as well. Again, from our perspective, um, uh, we knew when we launched uh, the MyCode Community Health Initiative that we didn't have evidence to, that there, this was going to be beneficial. So we. Uh, launched it as a research project, and uh, so the um, return of results, uh, uh, that initial visit, all that sort of stuff, is uh, the institution pays for that out of our research um, dollars. Now, once we have returned the result, then they transition into usual care, but we had the agreement with our health plan up front um, that any care that would be generated from this return of result that they would pay for, that they would, so if we found a BRCA result, they would pay for the breast MRI and they would pay for uh, the additional things that would be done. And if they had a member uh, that was a family member of the individual that they covered, they would pay for the cascade testing. So we'd done all that ahead of time. Now, even though we do have a provider-owned health plan, that's only about 40% of our patients. So 60% we're dealing with outside payers. Fortunately, we've not had any issues with the outside payers in terms of them picking up uh, the medical costs related to these return of results. So at least from that perspective, it, I, we're not sure if it's just because they don't know how we're getting the result or what, and we're not, you know, going out of our way to tell them either, um, but they are paying for it, so that's, uh, so that's good. Uh, but as we began to accumulate um, uh, the data, and we're still relatively early in the outcomes data, much more at the anecdote stage than we are in the really robust outcomes uh, um, uh, stage. Uh, it became evident to um, leadership, particularly our CEO, that this was something we really wanted to transition. And I think one of the key concepts of the learning healthcare system is you don't have research over here and clinical care over here and never the twain shall meet. But they're really both embedded. And so that's a model that we're very comfortable with in terms of having both of those, you know, sort of coexisting. And then it makes the transition much easier. So uh, as we move to transition this into, the, into a clinical realm with, a, a, you know, a re reimbursement from a payer um, uh, in our initial launch, um, uh, we were able to use essentially the same infrastructure we were able to cut out some things because, of course, we weren't relying on a research laboratory to actually do the testing. So as soon as the exome was done, we could use the information because it had been done in a CLIA certified laboratory. So we were able to cut out a lot of the extra steps that uh, were presented there. And so far, at least, it's, it's worked reasonably well. But we've not approached any other payers about that. And I think the reaction would generally be um, there's not insufficient evidence to warrant us paying 
for an exome in someone for which there is no indication, in other words, a population health uh, indication. But the reality is we do exomes all the time for a variety of reasons, whether it's for intellectual disability, autism, or other things. Once we have that exome data, we can use it for other purposes. We'll have the infrastructure to do that. So we'll leverage exomes that are being paid for for an indication to use for off-indication uh, results in that. And that's part of it also our approach with our pharmacogenomics program. A lot of historically the approach has been you target specific disease or indication, but our pharmacogenomics panel is broad. You can't order one related to you know just depression or, or what have you. you. You get everything or you get nothing, basically. And while it takes time to build this evidence, that's what we're trying to do. It's been a challenge to bring, I'll be honest with you, third-party payers to the, the table in a, in a meaningful way, but it's something we've been trying to, to engage in, in our community as well. But we're also trying to facilitate this. You know, we're, we're taking, you know, in the process of integrating with CancerLink, uh, Kevin mentioned as well. So it's something that one institution um, certainly, the side of North Shore isn't going to solve all these problems, but how can we contribute to that greater body as well in a, in a structured way? Because the questions the payers are asking are not necessarily the questions that we are as, as a health system are asking as, as the primary, but there has to be overlap to be successful. Okay, I'm not actually sure who was first on this side, but um, Heidi, do you want to go ahead? Sure. This is more for Lincoln. So you might. <laughs> Um, so the question is around the molecular tumor board and just understanding is, th is this, is every case discussed, you know, with a group of individuals, you know, and I was calculating roughly 30 to 40 per week based on your test volume or, you know, and is there any cost build for that or to what extent are most handled by perhaps an individual molecular pathologist and only the really tricky cases bubble up to a large, you know, could you talk a little bit about, because I think it's a really critical part of the process, but also incredibly expensive if everything goes through it, right? Yeah, great point. Uh, molecular tumor boards um, have a scaling problem. <laughs> and so when we first started, yes, we would, in front of our large molecular tumor board, review every case. We now um, have small molecular tumor boards where we just require two reviewers to review every case. And so that's how we've tried to get around the scaling problem. And we don't bill for that separately, so it's not something that we're charging for right now. We just bundle it into the, uh, the total cost of the test. Um, and then we're, we have uh, added additional uh, molecular tumor board members to accommodate the, the increased volumes. So that's how we've gone about trying to scale that. You know, I think with time and with additional data, you could start getting into an an augmented molecular tumor board where you may have enough data to inform uh, an algorithm that can make most of those calls and then all that an MTB does is sign off uh, instead of having to think de novo about each case. And, and the other thing we've done is really limit the amount of information that c accompanies each case so that the amount of decision making is lower. So we have, we have said a priori that all, that we will not comment on the standard of care um, uh, provisions. So we should, we're just assuming that patients are getting basic standard of care for their advanced cancer. And so we don't say, you know, this patient should have gotten, you know, this platinum doublet or whatever chemotherapy. We only, the molecular tumor board constrains their interpretation to just the genomic findings and that's it. Okay. Uh, Laurie, is it your card that's up? Yeah. Uh, so Lincoln, when you were presenting, you talked about your um, little pilot study with the genomic risk versus the, the non. And it struck me as we've been talking about when is there enough evidence to do implementation. Like that was the perfect time to do like a hybrid study where you say, all right, I'm gathering this evidence in this very nice little trial. And in addition, at the same time, I'm going to start looking at these characteristics of implementation science. So what exactly does the intervention look like? What were the required components to make it work? What kind of baseline knowledge did the providers have? Did you have to develop specific types of education to bring them on board? How, how was the health system driven? Was it a top-down approach from the CEO or was it grassroots because these providers were clamoring for it? You know, looking at all of those different pieces and pulling them together and then when you went and you did your large-scale you know, expansion, 
When, when was it working easily and when was it not? What were the different characteristics in each of those settings? And then what you have at the end of the day is like this beautiful little kind of, if you look like this and you wanna do it, this is what you need to do. And, and that's exactly what implementation science is designed to do. Now, my question would probably be, did you do that? And I <laughs> don't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I just felt like it was a perfect demonstration of where you can bring together the evidence collection and the implementation and start those processes together instead of waiting for the perfect time when you have all the data. Yeah. I wish we had met a few years ago. <laughs> um, no, we, we didn't. We didn't do that, and and I wish we had. And there, you know, there are a lot of things that um, I would have done slightly differently if we had to do it over again. It was kind of we we um, followed a sort of intuitive path, and uh, I could write up. I could go back now retrospectively and and follow one of these frameworks, and and you know, we could come up with the study. Um, and but we didn't do that, and partly it was because we were trying to move quickly, and um, and we didn't have a lot of resources. Um, but to answer your question, our in our case, it really was a grassroots effort. Uh, that then, when there was clear benefit to patients, then um, uh, you know the the executive team totally got on board, and it's been great ever since. Let's give Lincoln a rest for a second, and go to Rex, and then we'll go back to Mark. Well, actually, one of my questions was for Lincoln, but I'll, oh, well, I'll, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll ask the other I, one. I feel fine. <laughs> um, so, so, Kevin, I, I was struck by the number of people that you've got uh, serving as curators. And one of the things I wondered about is how do you assure consistency between all 250 of them? Um, 150. <laughs> Excuse me, 150. <laughs> Which is still too many, probably. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's all, all about uh, taking a portion of all the records, uh, about 10% actually. We run through multiple curators, and then we have a series of QA, QC um, uh, procedures and metrics that are in our protocol so that uh, at any given point, like in time, any day of the week, we can tell you, like, where where we're standing in terms of consistency, and so it's it's brute force and statistics. Okay, and and then just the second question was for Peter. You showed this really nice dashboard. Is that a home built thing or is that something? It, yes. That so that's home built. Um, it's uh, uh, using tab Tableau. It's something part of our um, you know analytics team helped us put together. We've had fortunately. I, I get the privilege of working with a very talented HIT bioinformatics group, and so how are we merging all this data together? Because um, it's unique. Um, is that, you know, Epic doesn't come out of a box telling you this information. So we've had to be conscientious, conscientious about how we built even just the, the order for these genetic tests so that we could pull out the data that we wanted to. And I think, you know, to kind of dovetail on the Intermountain motto. Uh, North Shore has a similar kind of motto. It's a different analogy, but we tend to build it and then try to build it better as, as we go, because we do learn each step of building. And so we've had to tweak the model, which is why I don't have the, that data yet, but that's obviously our goal to, to make it as accurate as possible. And, and that dashboard is available to everybody and all the providers in the health system? No, so that's something that's um, um, restricted to um, um, key uh, members of the um, uh, personalized medicine team. Um, we recognize that it's, it's very sensitive data to our providers and practice, and, and, and the goal is to improve things, not to have, you know, and, and to um, know where direction we need to, to go with it. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll make a follow-up comment and then um, uh, toss a question to, uh, to Lincoln. The, the ability to do reports out of the electronic health record that we all have is really pretty much limited to uh, the things that we're all required to collect. So meaningful use data, some of the um, uh, quality uh, improvement data that's needed for um, uh, reimbursement and that. And so uh, there are systems that come native to the uh, electronic health record system that will help to collect those data. But for basically anything substantive that you want to do, irrespective of whether it's genomics or not, you really have to build your own reports. Uh, and the uh, um, uh, 
tools that come equipped with the EHR are just not up to the task, uh, at least for systems that have gotten to a certain level where they're well beyond the sort of the basic level of, of quality reporting. Um, the, it's challenging sometimes to even get the data out uh, in terms of what the electronic health record automatically feeds. Uh, and so a lot of us have also had to build additional data captures uh, that are well beyond the back end of the health record. So that's another thing to uh, unfortunately have to think about when you're uh, uh, thinking about implementation. So the question I had, uh, Lincoln, um, uh, again, given my knowledge of Intermountain, I was very interested to hear about the uh, mental health pharmacogenomics. I think that's a great idea. Um, but, you know, Intermountain has been a leader in mental health integration, the use of um, uh, uh, alternative providers embedded within primary care practices to essentially offload uh, some of the uh, work that would otherwise fall to the primary care physicians. And so I'm curious if you leverage that infrastructure to uh, uh, take the pharmacogenomic testing uh, live or whether that was something that was done in addition to that integration structure. Yeah, so uh, Intermountain has published some uh, data on the cost savings that occurs when you integrate mental health directly into the primary care clinics. And as you said, it's a way to uh, sort of democratize access to mental health care um, by, by enabling primary care providers. So we basically piggybacked on that infrastructure. Initially, um, honestly, we hadn't thought of that. We thought of just going directly to our behavioral health um, care team, and they said, well, why not just go right through MHI? Uh, which is the mental health integration, and so we have done that. And then when we got into MHI, those primary care providers said, well, wh how come we don't make this available to all primary care clinics? And so uh, it sort of metastasized, um, you know, starting with just behavioral medicine and then going through that infrastructure. So great question. And, that, and so now it's available throughout all of behavioral, all the behavioral medicine clinics, all of the mental health integration clinics, and all the primary care clinics. Uh, Terry? So, so actually, I wanted to go back to molecular tumor boards, and if other people, so there are people along the sides that have other questions that might be more relevant to the current conversation. Bruce, if you wanted to take those. Um, no. There's apparently not right this second, so no, go ahead. No, they're shaking their heads. Okay, fine. I gave you a chance. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Uh, just a, a quick question for uh, Mark. You mentioned that the exome sequencing is done in a research lab, and then uh, if there's things, conf there are any positive results are confirmed. Is there a concern that if there's no results returned back to the patient that that is clinically interpreted as them being negative for things like BRCA1 or any of the relevant genes that you're testing? Right, so we've done extensive education um, uh, with our providers around the fact that um, if there's no return, uh, that means that there's no return. And that if there's a clinical test that's indicated uh, that test should be done, that we should not, we would not go back to this research exome to ask questions that really should be best asked with a clinical uh, test because um, uh, we don't know what the specific, while we think the performance characteristics of the exome are uh, robust, um, it's not a clinical test. Um, it is a bit frustrating for our uh, participants. We tell them right up front, we said, you know, um, you may not hear from us. Uh, it might be because we just haven't analyzed your exome yet, and we have 40,000 of them waiting in the queue to be sequenced, uh, or it may be because we didn't find anything. So as an example, I, I was part of my code. I've never heard anything from my code, but I was uh, one of the first to take advantage of the clinical sequencing, and I got my result in three and a half weeks, um, which was negative. So I still don't know whether my, my code sequence was negative or it hasn't been done or, or whatever. So we have that ambiguity. We're trying to figure out better ways to communicate to patients. But the, the, the basic bottom line is we, we don't want those sequences used for clinical indications because we're concerned that we could easily miss things that would be um, uh, picked up on, a, on standard clinical testing. For example, um, rearrangements in BRCA1 and 2, which is 10 to 15 percent of the individuals, that exome is very poor at calling those types of rearrangements. Okay, Terry. So um, hearkening back to the discussion this morning in terms of dissemination, I remember Howard mentioning back in, in GM9, I know, shocking, you're going to have to. Um, at any rate, that the molecular tumor board. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, that the tumor board was.
was, was actually a very effective educational tool and getting their fellows to, to attend it was a, a very useful way of sort of getting this you know, knowledge disseminated. And I, and I recall Baylor, when they started doing their clinical exomes, I mean, not when they started, but, but shortly after, the, and at the Genomic Medicine One meeting, they showed you know, slides of their exome sign-out conference, which was open to anyone. They would actually you know, bring pizza in and anyone who wanted to come, and the room was packed. I mean, it was, it was really a great educational effort to the point where they would video cast those. I don't know if they still do. So, so the, I guess the question more around the table was, is there a way to harness that ac across our medical care systems, recognizing that it's not scalable, but still there might be the opportunity, you know, once a month or once every couple of weeks or whatever to, to get together a group of, of fellows or trainees or physicians from the community to actually try and, and educate them a bit on how this is done. So we have a similar thing for rare disease and uh, genome odyssey board, which has been very successful. I don't know if everybody can hear me or not, but, um, but I'm not to throw cold water on the molecular tumor boards, but we had one and we stopped it. I think for the reasons that Heidi um, illustrated earlier, which is we felt our physician knowledge base had reached a level at which honestly the attendance was dropping and new discoveries were diminishing. So we, we've turned ours off for the time being at least because of some of the work Tempest is doing and bringing in RNA sequencing and other uh, circulating tumor DNA, we're thinking about restarting it, but for now we don't have one. So I don't know if I think it's kind of getting to the scale issue as well. Uh, since, I think my, uh, since my name was used in vain, um, I would mention uh, our tumor board, which we don't have pizza, but we do have Jimmy John's. Jimmy John's, freaky fast. Um, and um, what, uh, what we've done is we have a core group that is looking over every single case. And then we have a monthly two or three cases dug deep with lots of people involved that's semi-educational, semi-clinical. Always has a real clinical question, but there's an educational component. And that's kept people engaged. It allows us to justify having that monthly meeting, um, but doesn't, doesn't hit the problems that uh, that were just mentioned in terms of it being just a uh, an exercise with no no real point to it. We kind of have a sort of a hybrid. You know, we're still trying to find what does our molecular tumor board, what does that mean at North Shore? Are we going to integrate this information? Because we have a lot of different just tumor boards, so should we be targeting those as opposed to creating yet another uh, physician requir you know, requirement. We do have a consultation service with one of our champion oncologists where he will review this genomic data on a one-on-one -on -one basis to try to, you know, for the really uh, tough cases or to provide to oncologists who may not be as um, knowledgeable in the space so some reassurance about sort of what the next steps are, but you know, this is still a work in process at our institution. I imagine as um, the field matures, the Difficult questions become fewer, but there still always will be some where those kinds of conversations can be really valuable. I think there was a question way in the back. Maybe Liz, two. Oh, yes. Uh, All right, Liz, just go a ahead. quick question for Mark. So um, I think that notion of doing research and then flipping it to clinical when you send it out for clinical confirmation has lots of advantages. What happens when you get a discrepancy? between them? Yeah, we tracked that. Um, uh, we um, looked initially, and one of the reasons that we internalized our um, analysis pipeline was because we were looking to see, um, you know, if we compared our pipeline as it evolved with, um, uh, you know, an experienced laboratories uh, calling pipeline, what were we seeing that was different? And what we found was a very small uh, rate of difference, and the differences were ones that were really not clinically substantive. So we recognized that that was really, um, that we'd gotten to the point where we had a, a, a pipeline that would meet our, our um, um, purposes. Um, we've looked uh, at discrepancies in terms of the uh, exome call versus the clinical confirmation call. Most of those discrepancies are understandable. <coughs> it's poor performance of the exome in areas where there might be a lot of uh, repeat sequence or um, uh, uh, GC rich regions where the exome capture is just not working particularly well and we're getting erroneous reads. So a lot of those you could identify on the basis of the quality metrics of the exome is not being uh, likely. Uh, and then there are a few others that, uh, you know, that don't, but it's a very tiny percentage of the actual uh, calls themselves. 
we also then have uh, the interpretation um, where uh, both of our groups are using, um, and now all, all of the laboratories that we're using, uh, use the ACMG criteria um, uh, for uh, classification, and we um, look to see are we essentially calling things, we're only returning likely pathogenic and pathogenic because we're dealing with a uh, population where we're not having an indication, so we don't want anything to do with VUSs. Uh, those are all uh, false positives as far as we're concerned. Um, we have the advantage of having some clinical data, uh, which can sometimes help to clarify. And so I would say maybe, you know, once every couple of weeks there will be a discrepant uh, interpretation where we'll get some additional clinical data and we'll use that to resolve it. But um, we were pretty surprised, I think, by the, um, uh, the, the relatively low um, uh, level of discrepancy in all three of those areas. But that's something that we continue to track. Did you raise that? I want to thank all of our panelists for providing some really good examples of what can be done when clinical and molecular data can be accessed and analyzed. But all of the tooling and the reports that we heard about today require that access to structured data. Kevin, I was particularly struck by your example, as Rex had said. You've built some very impressive tooling, but then behind that you've got personnel dedicated to pulling all that data back out, structuring it and coding it. You've got a team of, if I heard you correctly, 15 to 20 people dedicated just to building NLP tools, and then 150 people dedicated to reviewing and curating those results. That is not something a typical or even atypical academic medical center is going to be able to do. And I think this highlights our collective um, a significant gap in our collective ability to effectively capture relevant clinical data in computable forms. We need the structured data, we need the standardized data, but we can't hope to turn our clinicians into data entry technicians. So we're left with this gap. Tempest has obviously invested very deeply in this. You've thought about this because you have a, a significant financial incentive to developing technology to extract these data and codify it more efficiently. And I'm wondering if, Kevin, not to put you on the spot, but to put you on the spot, and, <laughs> and as well as the other panelists, if you could comment about how we can scale this process more efficiently, because from a, a data standardization and normalization point of view, this is really at the heart of what we need to do to go forward. So, so three years ago when I was running uh, you know, a, a clinical trial at the University of Chicago, the way I got data out of the system was I hired a, a, a fellow um, or two, and they went through and pushed data into REDCap databases and so forth. And I, I mean, I, I, the Tempest, the, the data structuring component of Tempest, yes, there's a financial incentive to do it, but it only works at scale. And so whether it's Tempest or somebody else, I think a lot of the data structuring um, that is required to push this field forward is, is probably well done or maybe even best done uh, by the private sector who can do that as a service. We give all of the data back to each of the sites. And so, um, you know, we're not hoarding the data, we keep a de-identified aggregated set, which has value in the aggregate, but every site, no matter who we work with, we actually insist that they take the data back, because that data is meant to stimulate um, everything from your research to your, your quality uh, control. Um, and we, we help build reports and so forth to, 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 to stimulate those areas as well with our, our collaborators and the hospital system. So I, so I think, you know, it'd be silly for every individual hospital to build their own unique NLP and, and, and you know, data curation team. Um, it's something that scales. It's, it's ditch digging. And... Um, for want of a better analogy, it's, it's ditch digging or lawn mowing, and we just have to go out there and, and, and dig those ditches, and it's, it's best done in industry for the most part, I, I believe. Heidi, did you have another question? Oh. So I just did a comment on that as well with the data integration. So I think part of, you know, at North Shore, you know, we're going to be a continued kind of hybrid of some things we're going to do in-house. We have very t talented molecular pathologists, but a lot of things we're going to 
do externally through strategic you know, partnerships. And so part of the fundamental question is how much of this data actually has to live in the EMR versus pulled from somewhere else? So is it necessarily important that our EMR knows that what the genomics coordinate of, our, of the BRCA2 uh, variant that's been found? Maybe not, maybe so, depending on what your organization's goals are. But I think for most community centers, just knowing, okay, there's a pathogenic BRCA2 mutation right now is going to be sufficient. So, you know, part of what we've done is we've built um, a variant repository called FLIP, and it has different uses depending on who you talk to in our organization. So it captures some of our next generation sequencing data from some of the tests that do in-house. It pulls in data from external labs that we've partnered with. It drives our clinical decision support for um, our pharmacogenomics program, which pings out to ACT-X. So it means a lot of different things, but what it accomplishes is a, 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 a relatively seamless but consistent interface with our EMR so we can have a little bit more flexibility with integration across different um, entities of where we're getting data, whether it's you know updating from ClimVar, whether it's clinical lab data, whether it's some of our research initiatives as well. And what I would um, add is that I think we've not really addressed an important question, and this to some degree is dependent on the use, but um, I think we always tend to um, approach the idea, well, let's just get everything. Um, and I think a more useful question is, well, what do we really need and when do we need it? Uh, sort of a minimum data question as opposed to, um, you know, getting everything. Now, for the cases that Tempest handles that are very complex, that approach is probably a reasonable one. But as an example, at Geisinger, uh, we have, because of, the, of our population demographics with uh, uh, their uh, obesity and smoking and that sort of thing, abdominal aortic aneurysm is a pretty big deal for us. And we recognize that there were a lot of uh, AAAs that were being found on imaging that was done for other reasons and was not being followed up on. And we said, well, this is a huge opportunity. And so we developed an NLP program that's very simple that just looks at the radiology notes, looks at um, you know, the specific language, and they can pull out in real time as radiology notes come in, whether they're generated by our PAC system or scanned in from an outside record, if there's a AAA that meets a certain size criteria and we ping the uh, clinician to say, you need to evaluate this patient for AAA, and we have a, uh, you know, a, a series now of patients that have been identified because we've done that. That's not something we would ever turn over to industry to do, um, but it's also a very narrow purpose. And, and so I think when we're talking about genomics, um, we sometimes get overwhelmed by all of the different things that we could potentially do if we had the sequence data, but we don't have to do it all at once. Um, and so, uh, you know, if we think about whether it's an oncologic indication, what are the specific data that we need? If it's what we're doing with 61 genes, what's the specific data we need? It's not huge data. It's, it's what Zach Kahani was talking about with simple data, that sometimes we go for the big data and, and it's the simple data that we can really focus on and, and, and accomplish things with. So I think that type of a strategy, um, um, and frankly, there's, there's more structured data in there than we sometimes realize, uh, and uh, it takes talented people to know where it lives, but it can be found. So uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there to be able to, to do that. So I, I just want to agree with that. I'm not suggesting that, like, industry should be structuring all data. And I've seen the radiology uh, teams work and met with them, and it's it's a very, very impressive at Geisinger. And, you know, I think the point is there's a certain set of standard data fields. So, for example, we, we collect 30 to 50 data fields, maybe a little north of 50 sometimes, um, depending on tumor subtype and, and, and the situation according to a formula. And so if, if and, they're, and they're, they're obvious stuff. It's like, what therapies did you get? How, what, how long with progressive free survival, et cetera? And, and it's that stuff that's, you know, quite frankly, for, for, for reasons we all understand, um, locked up in, in Epic and Cerner and, and so forth. And so it's, it's just the dirty job of digging them out and getting them structured and getting, get, getting certain fields structured. But when you're doing cutting edge research, now you're enabled to do, th those fellows in my, in my laboratory today just get the data and analyze it. <laughs> and then they go and look at like radiomic uh, parameters and things like that and develop new things. And so I, I think that's the world we, 
we, we want to move toward, at least until we live in a world where, uh, where there's interchangeable, interoperable EMRs and everyone holds hands and sings kumbaya. So I was told that we can take five extra minutes. We have, I count five cards up in seven minutes. You do the arithmetic. Bob, you're on. Um, so so I, I think Bob's point, well, I'm going to paraphrase Bob, so that brute, brute force works, um, uh, but it isn't always the most elegant solution. It may be in this case that in this particular point in time, that's what we need to do, but there are more elegant solutions that will scale better in the future that have to do with data standardization and, and communication protocols. So hopefully that clarifies it. So a question for uh, Lincoln, you mentioned the cost data. Is that truly cost data versus charge or reimbursement? And are you able to capture <coughs> costs from like long-term health care facilities and rehab and things like that? Or is it, um, uh, how, so how well do you think you're capturing all of the costs for those patients? So uh, yes, it is actually data. charge data. And um, we think we capture for patients that were covered by our health plan, Select Health, we think we're capturing all of the, you know, any related charge during the time of the study. So, so if they were in some skilled nursing facility or something like that, then presumably we would have captured that. Jeff? Oh. Um, I'm, so I, I, when you say you're using charge data, again, it probably is not a big deal if you're using just Select Health data, since they'll be using the same um, it's, it's charge panel, but against if you're, itself, sort of, so to speak, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, across uh, one method to, to normalize, which I think is what <coughs> you're getting at, is um, you can use standardized costing using a Medicare fee schedule or something like that to be able to make sure that you're comparing apples and apples when you're saying yeah. looking at different payer data. Yeah, yeah, so, the, um, gosh, it was, you know, a whole separate team that did that, and I don't know if they use that standardized, you know, Medicare fee schedule or not. Jeff, did you? Yeah, I, I continue to think about the evidence generation challenge, and um, I was thinking about the in the cardiovascular world, uh, 20 years ago, the National Cardiovascular Data Registry was started, which now captures data from 2,400 hospitals and has led to quality improvement, coverage decisions, guideline development, research. Anyway, the point is I'm listening to Intermountain and uh, North Shore and Geisinger, and I'm sure others in the room, that are still generating a lot of important data, but in a siloed way. And I would think I would think that coming out of this meeting, one thing we could begin to consider is the formation of a genomic medicine registry that would could be very powerful in terms of evidence generation. And of course, if we engage the payers in you know, helping us think about what the structure would be, that it would help them with the evidence evaluations. Um, that could be a very positive move forward. I'd be interested if anybody any comments. So we, we um, I think, institutionally believe that data sharing is important. Uh, it's one thing to say that, and it's a totally different thing when you try to get people to start sharing data. And, and um, God, it's amazing how uh, uh, attorneys get nervous about what that means and what data can be shared. But I don't, I don't think that's a problem. We've taken steps in that regard. We have formed, actually, a data sharing consortium in oncology specifically um, called OPEN. There are others out there. One is Genie, and, and there's a few others. Um, but a genomic medicine, I think, data sharing effort uh, or consortium uh, is something that um, I think would provide a lot of value. And we could provide, I mean, the cardiology community, who's obviously done this uh, for 20 years more, could provide some insights as to how to actually structure this. We don't have yeah. to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. yeah, help us avoid some landmines. Uh, some of the, you know, initiatives are away with Cancer Link, you know, being an example that Kevin talked about. So, you know, where are the areas to fit so we aren't duplicating efforts as well is going to be important as well. But we feel the same way, you know, we're on the roadmap for, uh, you know, trying to integrate as well with Cancer Link and other initiatives. I think one of the challenges we realize is that there are actually, it's not so much standardization of the data, there's a lot of standards out there. And so how do we reach consensus on what that standard looks like across the different institutions? I think there's a step before that, and, and um, you know Jeff is familiar with this because it's work that um, Ignite's done uh, as well, and that's about actually uh, landing on what do we agree on as out important outcomes. Um, again, if we don't define the outcomes, then it doesn't. You know, then we're just collecting data, and we may have the right data by chance, but we don't necessarily will have all the data. Um, 
So uh, um, eMERGE uh, published, a, or the Outcomes Working Group eMERGE published a paper looking at the ClinGen Actionability Working Group output uh, compared to the defined eMERGE outcomes to try and take an initial step at harmonization. And I think that's something that we talked about potentially then doing across the other NHGRI funded uh, consortia like CSER and IGNITE uh, so that we would begin to create a, a toolbox of outcomes that we can all agree on for certain genomic medicine use cases, we would all collect data around it. And that would be a necessary step, uh, I think, before we develop the, or at least would inform the development of what that data repository would look like. Uh, so let's do Heidi and then uh, Terry and then Dan, and then I think that'll be all we have time for. So this builds off this data sharing question, and this is specifically somewhat for Lisa's um, talk. We talked about using, when you saw a variant, to be able to go back to BioView and see what the phenotype risk score was. So it occurred to me that that data set would be a perfect data set to a new model we're exploring in the Global Alliance around uh, a variant matchmaker that builds off our gene matchmaker exchange where it's a federated network and the institutions agree that people through an API can query, do you have a patient or multiple patients with this variant, and if so, return the phenotype to me as a way to explore what patient level data is on a given variant. Do you think the consent within BioView is such that that kind of federated API-based access to return phenotype when, I'm, when I would query with a variant is possible with that data set? I think it's possible, although I try not to ever answer questions about consent and I had to just always move this to somebody who is actually an expert. But I think it's a really interesting idea and I think just like with my experience in the UDN, um, the m most often what we're able to do when people have candidate variants that look they think might be pathogenic, if we can identify a number of individuals who don't seem to have any medical problems whatsoever, that's helpful information. And if you have, um, if, if if I understand correctly, your variant matchmaker is going to have people who are affected predominantly, correct? Oh, is that not true? No. So, it, Heidi, the, it, the, the, the work that Lisa described is all done in a de-identified set. And that's fine. It's, right. As long as the genotype and phenotype are together in there. Right, uh, no, absolutely. And, and the, just, I mean, and just imagine what you could do if, if it weren't, you know, 20,000, but it was 2 million people with yeah. those kind of data. That's, I think that's to telegraph, that was what I was going to say. <laughs> I, won't, I won't. Okay. Um, yeah, I also think that, you know, even though ICD codes are certainly not the deepest type of phenotype that you can get, not near what you can get from having 150 people abstract your charts for you, on the other hand, they're very, very portable, um, and they can give you an idea of if the variant is in any way possible to cause, let's say, epilepsy or something like that. Um, it, you have decent capture of really broad phenotypes. So I think that that could make the whole method amenable to people kind of pooling their data together to start aggregating these large populations so that you do have information on a lot of different types of variants. Terry? So on the question of outcomes, one of the things we struggle with at NHGRI is that the research studies we fund typically are funded for a four-year period. When we're really lucky, we get them to five years, um, and that's pretty much it. So, so you know, if you're, if you're designing a study that, you know, there's a year of protocol development uh, at the beginning, a year of analysis at the end, maybe you can shorten each of those to six months, but you're still left with about a three-year period in which to recruit and intervene and get your outcomes. And so my question for the group, and particularly those who need to be convinced, or at least to assess the, the value of this, is what kind of outcomes can we get other than process outcomes? That is, the, you know, the clinicians looked at the, the, the test or they changed some aspect of care or whatever, but, but can we really get health care outcomes other than in people who are desperately ill and, and about to have an endpoint anyway? You know, what kind of outcomes can we look for? And Mark, it looks like you're ready to answer. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be dismissive of process outcomes um, because um, uh, there's a reason that we collect them. Um, the primary reason is they're easy, but the secondary reason is there's actually, in many cases, data uh, that is um, uh, the evidence uh, that it actually relates to a health outcome. Um, and I think uh, there are certain intermediate outcomes that would be captured uh, within that time frame as well. Uh, you, you know, getting an LDL to control or something of that nature. Uh, so each of those is not a health outcome, but again, if you're, you know, looking at 
um, familial hypercholesterolemia in the pediatric population, um, you're going to need a 50-year outcome study. Right. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and for, so for most things, I think what we, what we have to do is we have to be thoughtful about what is the evidence that actually links a process or an immediate, intermediate outcome to the health outcome of interest, how easy is it to capture the data, and one thing that payers are really interested in um, turns out to be do people really act on the information? So in other words, if we do this test and we return it, what if nobody that gets a BRCA result actually gets breast imaging or actually does anything with it? Well, that's an important data, but if they all change health behavior, uh, that's something that the health plans really say that's the currency because that's the, we need, what's going to change people's health behavior because ultimately that's what we recognize is going to bring value to us. So, so can I just ask, I mean, would, would those others around the table who are, who are maybe not as, as research oriented as Mark and I are, um, are, are those kinds of process outcomes um, compelling to you or are there, there are other kinds of outcomes, and this may be a question that you have to think about over dinner and we come back and talk about tomorrow, but, but are there other kinds of outcomes that we can get in a short term in, in a relatively general population since we are the OM Institute, we don't study just cancer or just heart disease or just other things like that. So any thoughts on that? Now or so later. I think Mark's example of the LDLR reduction is, a, is, is somewhere between a process outcome and an outcome outcome because I think the vast majority of people in the cardiovascular science area would accept the idea that lowering LDL probably has a beneficial effect, um, especially if you lower it with the usual statins, which we know are highly, highly effective. So, so there are outcomes that are process outcomes that people would label process outcomes that are, that are actually outcome outcomes, I think. Yeah, and I think that, I think, I'm sorry, go, uh, I was just going to say that um, we also haven't have done much in the patient reported outcome realm, and I think that that's something that, again, we could get relatively um, interesting information. So the family history study that Nadim Qureshi did in the UK, where um, they identified uh, that when they returned the family history about cardiovascular disease, that they noticed a significant um, uh, increase in smoking sensation, cessation. It was sensation, too. Um, <laughs> But uh, they, they weren't powered to detect a significant difference, but they found a significant difference because the impact of that information really spoke to those folks. But they wouldn't have gotten that if they didn't get the patient reported outcome data. And I think um, ultimately at the end of the day, it's about the patients. And if the patients say, this is important information to us and we're going to make health behavior changes, that's pretty important. So to dovetail on that, I, I echo completely. You know, we published on our pharmacogenomics data that we actually did some implementation science tools with uh, Amy Lenke, and patients said that, you know, those interviewed um, um, and, and developed themes. I'm sure I'm butchering the language because I'm still learning this. But one of it was um, uh, assurance that, um, in this case, our health system was taking a full look at, well, what are the different factors related to my medications? And even if no change was made to their medications after they went through pharmacogenomics, they felt more confident in what was prescribed and were more likely to adhere to their medications. And I think there's one thing as clinicians we can agree on. If a patient doesn't take their medication, it's not going to give them any benefit. Well, we've about exhausted our extended... <laughs> Dan, did you have a comment? Yeah, so I, I, I think what I've heard this afternoon is the value of of big, big data sets in, 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 in discovery and in implementation. And, I, and I, it feels like sort of the beginning of GWAS. We have lots of, lots of chattery signals, lots of signals that might be real. And with bigger, bigger data sets, it becomes obvious which signals are real and which signals are just sort of in the, in the weeds. So, so I, as Eric and company start to think about the next generation, I think generation of very, very large data sets of phenotype and genotype information is sort of feels like a priority for not just the obvious reasons, but for the discovery kinds of reasons that we've heard today. I, I like to tell people, you know, wouldn't it be lovely if Nomad had a column that said phenotype, had a column that said phenotype in addition to everything else. But I, uh, so th that was my Great. comment. Oh. But, it, but isn't isn't that exactly what um, the um, all of us is about? I mean, I. I I mean, it's a, it's a lot of what a lot of initiatives are about, in, in, including the sort of the genomic alliance initiatives, all, all the initiatives, in but it, we're at the beginning of a story, and I think that a million people probably isn't enough. 
but UK Biobank plus all of us. And the thing that I, I, I keep coming back to is Terry's time limited ability to fund and UK Biobank and all of us right. don't and, have and, that and, same problem. And, 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 and Kevin's resource and, and to some extent, you know, BioView and uh, th those seem to have legs that are longer than, than a four or five year timeline. Well, we, we've exhausted the extended time and the little timer up front has stopped counting, which can't be a good sign. <laughs> so, yeah, right. I'm not going to therefore try to summarize, but I just want to end with um, three very quick points that kind of um, came to my mind listening to this. One is sustainability of these various implementation projects. You know, deans come and go, CEOs come and go, their motivation may too, and I guess to Terry's point about um, how long can you sustain a, an implementation test. I think that'll be a, an important question for us to look at long term. The second thing is apparently everything works. Um, we heard about multiple success stories. And I guess it would be interesting at some point to hear the hard lessons that learning health systems have learned along this path. What didn't work and why and what can we learn from that? The third thing was what went through my mind as I was listening to Kevin's talk, or maybe not listening to it, actually more watching it. Um, those of us who are stuck in the dungeon of um, Cerner um, will say that they were just plain ugly. Um, it's, it's painful, frankly, to look at the screens on these things. And watching the very high-tech sort of cool things, apparently, um, you know, fueled by an army of hamsters in the background. But Nevertheless, um, I, I often wonder if part of the issue with getting clinicians to adopt this is that it's, if you're doing something high tech, it ought to look high tech. And you know, we're stuck in utilitarian systems that don't. And I guess a question I would you know, raise maybe for the future is what could be called systems engineering and how you actually design things so that people really want to use them. I'll end it at that, thank you. Great. So, um, so we are going to take a break, but it's only a 20-minute break. My apologies. We don't have any food for you. That's part of, you know, our austerity and efforts to reduce obesity. So, um, <laughs> so we're all going to run on the treadmill for 20 minutes. So, so please be back at, at 4.30 sharp. We have a, an experiment um, that we're very much looking forward to, a debate um, from two of our colleagues. So be back at 4.30. <laughs>